This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. Lorette's up there as a, as a wide out too. The ball goes into the end zone and it is incomplete. Intended for Campbell. Now there is a penalty flag thrown. Hold on. Oh, the phone. Everybody comes running down on the field. You got to get off because there's a penalty flag thrown and I think it's against Miami. And if it's thrown in the end zone, the ball will be placed on the one yard line. First and goal. Glenn Sharp trying to cover Chris Campbell, and he may have arrived a tad too soon. Randy Crystal. Yep. Well, the pass interference call that we still talk about today, and especially if you're an Ohio State or Miami fan, that call is one of the most famous, or I guess infamous, pass interference calls in college football history, especially from a championship game. There's very few to remember, but that's one we do. Welcome in to Distant Replay. This is the podcast where we go back and watch one game. We relive one game, and we pick it out for a variety of reasons. Championships, big moments, just crazy plays, maybe with some weather down the stretch, whatever it is, we pick out one game, we go back and watch it in its entirety, the way it aired. We come in here and we talk about that game all over again. And tonight, we're talking about the 2002 BCS National Championship game. It is the Fiesta and this was a national championship between Miami and Ohio State. I am Ben George, along with Mike Noto, who grew up a Miami fan. So we are going to uh, touch on your team tonight, my friend. Yeah, the 90s and uh, 2000s were my wheelhouse for college football, and the team I followed religiously were the Miami Hurricanes. So uh, this is a game I, when we started deciding which games to cover here on this podcast— this is one that I circled, so I'm glad we're going to get into it tonight. And just to give you a heads up, Mike, just run down your teams for everybody, because I, I love how you're kind of all over the place. All right, so I grew up in the New York area, so I like the Jets, the Mets, the Knicks, and the Rangers. Okay, fair. Yes. Pr- pretty standard. It's not a rule, but in general in the New York area, it goes more Jets, Mets, Giants, Yankees. Right. And then from a college standpoint, I took the approach with I sort of got to pick, because there's no real allegiances where I grew up to different college teams. So I basically chose teams that caught my eye when I was younger. So I'm a University of Miami football fan and a University of Michigan basketball fan. So if you you were a kid, if you were a kid in the early nineties, like I was when I started watching sports in the college sports, at least there are no two more exciting teams than Miami football and Michigan basketball. Maybe not as much since the the nineties have (laughs) have those pro. I mean, Michigan's been good in basketball lately and Miami had their, their run certainly, but you know, it is a little bit strange that I don't have geographical ties to uh, my college teams. And that's probably the main difference between where I grew up and where you grew up. Yeah. So Miami, look, Miami was the team of the eighties, nineties, one of the most popular teams because of their swagger. And that carried all, all the way into the early two thousands, which is where we're focused in on for this episode. And this is kind of the end of their dynasty that they had running for about 15, 20, about 20 years or so. Uh, And we'll talk about that game tonight. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at Distant Podcast. You can email us, distantpodcast at gmail.com and check out the website for show notes and a link to the video to watch this game at distantreplaypodcast.com. So let's get started on this game and let's start from the top. Why we picked this one. This was the national championship game. As I mentioned, BCS national championship game. And it was all because of that one pass interference play. And I'm sure... When you think back on this game, Mike, that's probably like the moment you think of on this game. Is there anything else that you remembered about this game before you watched it? The McGahee injury. Yeah. To, and to be honest, as a fa- probably because I'm a, I was, I'm a fan, that's what I think of first. And I, then I think of the pass interference call. Yeah, that was that was uh, something we'll talk about tonight. But that was uh, one of the more gruesome injuries that I can remember, and one that was really tough to watch. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more and where McGay he went from there. But uh, that was a big play in this moment. And that and I do remember that one as well. But definitely the pass interference kind of sticks out to me more than anything in that call happening. But this was uh, the rare double overtime national championship game, which was pretty cool. Where were you for this game? I was um, I was watching this game. So when I'm watching my teams play, I try not to be around too many people. 
Smart. Uh, I don't want to. I, I don't want to sound like a lunatic, and I don't want people there who uh, don't understand the gravity of the moment for me. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> I get it. So get that it. could work for or against you. So um, I watched it with a buddy of mine that is not a Miami fan, but he's a normal sports fan, and I knew he wasn't going to get stupid. So yeah, like he's not going to like, hey, let's flip over and just catch the score of the uh, the baseball game real quick, like or the college basketball game. He's not going to do that. Like that's those are the kind of people you don't want to watch it with. They need to understand what's happening and. For me, and like the first bunch of these first episodes we're doing are all kind of the same time period, so it kind of we kind of sound like a broken record, but it'll probably change at some point. But I, for me, it was college watching with some friends, you know, being a college football fan and at a school like that, it was it was a uh, a big game that you'd always want to watch, and you you make a big event out of it. I don't remember specifically specifically where I was in terms of like the bar or or a friend's house, but definitely remember watching this game uh, when it aired live. So let's kind of go into what made this game important and kind of set the stage on the season, these two teams, kind of how we got here and why this game beyond beyond the fact that it was a national championship one versus number two, kind of what made this important. And I think, Mike, you got to start with the fact that Miami at this point was what USC would become in a few years and what Alabama is now. They were the, the team in college football. Yeah, I mean, just some of the quick numbers from this team. Uh, you know, Ken Dorsey, the quarterback for Miami during this run, was 38-1 and coming into this game as a starter. Uh, Larry Coker, who replaced Butch Davis uh, the season prior to this game, uh, was 24-0 and coming into this game. So Miami ran the table the year before this game, ran the table up until this point to the national championship game versus Ohio State. And the year before they won the national championship that I just mentioned the previous season, they were a one-loss team that didn't win the national championship, but absolutely trounced Florida in, in the Sugar Bowl. So this was a three-year run by Miami where um, they were, especially that that year, the year before um, this, this championship game, where they ended up beating Nebraska in the national championship game, that team was an absolute juggernaut. Yeah. and roll through everyone, including Nebraska. And even that team that had one loss, uh, I think I believe their loss was at Washington early in the season. Uh, right. And back then, Washington, you know, much like they are, I mean, they're competitive now, but they're always tough to beat up in Seattle. And Miami lost that game. I think it was the second game of the year. And from that point until this game against Ohio State, they hadn't lost. Yep, 34-game winning streak was on the line for this Miami team. And... Look, they were number one just about the entire season. It's interesting you go and, and look at it. I don't have the actual rankings in front of me, but they were number one all but one week. And I don't really know what caused them to drop, but uh, the November 9th week, they were number two. So I don't know who knocked, I don't know how in the world, after what they had been through and how many games they had won, how they got dropped down to number two. I, I probably should research that, but they were number one otherwise, wire to wire. But there were some close games for both of these teams. I mean, for Miami, early on, they got off to a good start, but they survived Florida State, that rivalry game 28 27 they won that game then Pitt who was ranked at the time they won that game by seven and then a great Virginia Tech game to finish off the season they won 56 45 so pretty close a couple games for them and able to in order to survive and then Ohio State this team on the other side under Jim Trestle you know, this was his second season as well. So he was kind of trying to get the program. They weren't necessarily off the map, but they had kind of had a couple, you know, mediocre years and he kind of brought them back to life. But, you know, his team was a solid play different than Miami. They were more, hey, let's, let's run the ball and play defense. So they had a lot of close games throughout the year. They beat Cincinnati by four. They beat Wisconsin by five points. They won 13-7 over Penn State. Great Big Ten score there, right? Another Big Ten shootout, 10-6 over Purdue. And then that Michigan game, which was a huge one at the time, that one was a 14-9 victory. So, And they had an overtime win over Illinois. So this team, they were good, but they survived a ton of close games. And that's why when they went into this game, they were an underdog. Yeah, they were an underdog, and probably rightfully so. I, I still remember that play, that fourth down play against Purdue with Krenzel to to Michael Jenkins. I still remember that play. Uh, do you remember that at all? I don't know. Oh, okay, so it, it, go watch. It was such a Craig Krenzel pass, like he just threw it up. You know what I mean? It was a, it was a real super clutch play, a fourth down play. A uh, long pass down the sideline to Michael Jenkins. I remember that play from this season. And I just remember Ohio State's M.O. You know, for years, they're a team that couldn't get over the hump. The John Cooper years against Lloyd Carr in Michigan. Now they get Trestle, the guy coming from Youngstown State. They sort of take on his identity. Their game plan in this game and a lot of games when you watch them throughout the season was to rely on that defense and not screw up as much as the other team. You know, that's basically yep. what it was. Krenzel only had two games this whole season where he passed for over 200 yards. 
Yeah, so they I mean, were they they relied on the running game and their defense and and not turning the ball over as much. Yeah, that was that's been the that was really the recipe for a lot of teams um, up until you know just a handful of years ago. I mean, that was what Alabama was was really well known for at the beginning of the Saban era. I mean, even going back to like the Gene Stallings era. But a lot of teams like this, out of the Big Ten, would play that style of play, and it worked really well. And uh, it was put to the test in this game. I quickly went back and, and looked at that Miami dropping number two. They fell behind Oklahoma, who had come off three straight wins against number three Texas, number nine Iowa State, and number thirteen Colorado. But then that week they went to number one. They lost at A and M unranked a m team so there's your little nugget from that season i don't know how miami didn't stay number one until he lost but uh, i digress so a couple other nuggets from this the start of this game and kind of leading into it so this was the first big 10 team to play in a bcs championship ohio state the buckeyes were 13 and 0 for the first time ever uh, in their school history and then mike doss kind of give me some background on the players mike doss you know stud safety had an impact in this game he would come back for a senior season whenever I thought he was going to leave and be an early draft pick. He came back along with uh, Maurice Claret, the running back, who enrolled early in the spring before really many players. I mean, now it's very common for somebody to enroll early in school, but Claret did that back then, and it was kind of rare. And because of that, he was able to get prepared for this game and uh, in the season and be ready to play for this team and, and really had an impact throughout the year. So the, 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 the quick point spread for this one, Mike, did you see it? I didn't, know. Could you guess what it would be? What would you, what would you think this point spread would be? I'd say somewhere around 10. Yeah, Ohio State plus 12. Okay. Buckeyes plus 12. So a live underdog going into this game. Uh, indeed. So that's kind of a little background on why this game is important. I mean, I know you, you know, this is a the big showdown to, you know, blue bloods of college football. It doesn't really get any better than this in terms of a matchup, but you know, that's kind of setting the stage on how we got to this point in the season. So let's get into the game discussion a little bit and begin with outdated observations. One of my favorite parts of the show. So I got a couple for you, Mike, I'll throw your way first to lead things off. Uh, the, in the open, and we'll post this link. They had the full open on uh, on ABC, which was pretty awesome to see. But in the open, they showed the BCS Championship Trophy. And the sponsor of the BCS Championship Trophy was the Circuit City BCS Trophy. And I had totally forgotten that Circuit City had any their hand in any of these uh, bowl games at all. And, you know, the electronic store, which I think is now officially out of business, I think it might have been coming back at some point, but it had closed down. They, at this time, were really in the heart of like the TV air and everybody upgrading TVs and electronics was great. But right before streaming came along and all the technology changed, Circuit City was uh, was spending quite a bit of coin on this game. Circuit City, yeah. They're, they're not, I don't think they're in business anymore where you have Circuit City or Nobody Beats the Wiz. Uh, uh, yeah. these, pla- these places were huge back in the day. And I did notice that. And again, we talk about this almost every episode, but how, I know it's not breaking news that technology changes quick, but when you start seeing it in these, in some of these observations that we make every episode, it really, it's really stark. I mean, these circuit yeah. cities, they, they were monstrous stores. It's not like they were, uh, they were little, little stores. They, they were huge stores that seems, seemed like, you know, I'm sure it was a gradual process, but it seemed like all the circuit city and all those type of stores just evaporated overnight. Yeah. And I liked circuit city. I was a big fan. Another outdated item. Jimmy Kimmel show was just launching. They ran a promo during the game promoting the Jimmy Kimmel show. And this was a time when Jimmy Kimmel, remember this was like when they took a risk on Kimmel because he was like the Mando guy. What didn't really have any like national hosting appeal really at that time. And, uh, you know, here we are, what, 16 years later, guys still got one of the top shows on TV. Jimmy Kimmel, let's put it this way. For those of you who are, who are most familiar with recent Jimmy Kimmel, there probably hasn't been a celebrity I can remember in recent memory that's on TV as much as Kimmel that's changed his image as much oh, as yeah. Kimmel has. I mean, he is light years. Literally what he was known for, and for me, before he got this gig on Late Night, was obviously the man show, but more in particular, that skit where he made fun of Karl Malone. Uh, I don't know if you remember that one. <laughs> I don't or not. remember that one either. Uh, yeah, drop Pro- all those prob- references that I need to go back and watch. Problematic if you watch it now. <laughs> yeah, so well, that's yeah. what. So it, 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 all this, it, Jimmy. I mean, he's taking a complete 180. You know, I mean, the reasoning behind that, who knows? I'm, I'm sure we could guess and speculate, but. Yeah, and when I saw the previews for it, you know, when he was coming out with this this late show, you're like Jimmy Kimmel, the guy from the Man Show. He's going to be on yeah. a real network, <laughs> like you because you didn't know, you didn't know at the time if he was going to do a version of the Man Show on actual network TV. Yeah, that was a big question. He has changed completely from back then. The last item I had that was outdated, another promo. This was this actually aired 
after the first overtime. I don't. I didn't see it mentioned once before this, so I don't know if this was something they were trying to get in late. Like, hey, we got some bonus promos. We got time. Get these in. Whatever. But a promo for the Bachelorette, the, ser- the series premiere of the Bachelorette. Who would have guessed that that show would become one of like the all time biggest shows in terms of reality TV on. I mean, absurd how much that thing grew. Look, I had known Kimmel was on for a while. I, I admit, I didn't know it was, uh, you know, 16 years, 17 years. I had no, absolutely no <laughs> clue that The Bachelorette was on this long. Absolutely none. I was like, is that, I, was, I had to double take. I was like, this show's been on for that long? I know you watch it. I know you watch it religiously, but I don't, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I don't watch it. So, but I can't believe it's been on that long. It's, it's incredible. People Fake are just news. looking, people looking to find love, you know? If I would have told you, Hey, did you realize that Keith Jackson read a bachelorette promo during the national championship football game? I would have blown your mind. You would have, <laughs> he would have thought he, it. He would have been a good host of the bachelorette. He, yeah, he, he, he would, he could host anything with those, with those pipes. That guy was amazing. Absolutely. Um, so those are my outdated items. You got anything that you noticed? I literally had those two things. I no had AOL. the two. I, I I did no AOL this yeah. episode. They didn't. They they couldn't. They didn't buy any any time here. But no lie, like the two I had in my notes were the Jimmy Kimmel promo and the Bachelorette preview. There you like, go. Those are the two things I had. So we're on the same page. All right. Yeah. So into the game we go, and we'll start with the broadcast. Broadcast ABC had this game. So this is before ESPN took over. I mean, it's still obviously a Disney owned uh, company and a sister network to ESPN. But before ESPN really took over the BCS and owned it just a handful of years later when they put all their all these big games on cable rather than network. So this is still kind of the era where network was the real big uh, landing ground for these these huge, huge events. That's where you wanted it to be. And that's where it was for this game. Keith Jackson, Dan Fouts on the call. Two of the greats. We've seen them multiple times, but they were on the call for this one. Along with on the desk, they had the desk on the field. John Saunders and Terry Bowden made an appearance. Yeah, John Saunders was the best. When I think of John Saunders, I think of a, a lot of different ESPN events, related events. But I, I think of college basketball for some reason. He was yeah. huge on their Big East coverage and yeah, their true. Big Mo- Big Monday. Remember all those? I don't know if they still have all those theme nights for the college fo- college basketball. But he was a presence on there. Um, Terry Bowden's. I actually thought he was always pretty good when he was in the studio for college football. He's sort of a random guy to have in there. But I, I always thought he was pretty good. And the guys on the game, uh, this is the second game now we've done where uh, these two guys were on the call. And right. apparently they were a little uh, institution here in college football in the uh, mid-2000s. I had no idea they were on this little run where they did a lot of the important games for uh, ABC here. I, and I... It's just something I didn't remember. Yeah, I definitely remember Keith Jackson, but uh, I don't really associate Fouts as kind of his guy during that period. But as we see, it was. Uh, and just to give you a little context on Terry Bowden. So this is a guy that had just finished up at Auburn, but he's, he'd been out of coaching at this time for four years. His last year at Auburn was in 1998. And it's kind of, I mean, I think he was on TV for a number of years before he got back into coaching in 2009 when he went to North Alabama and then finished up at Akron uh, a year ago in 2018 where he ran the Zips. Basically, not into ground, but they didn't they only had like Terry one, ba- one, wait, 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 one wait, wait, wait. This is This is breaking news to me. Terry Bowden coached Auburn, and they didn't they go undefeated the year they were on probation? His, his very first year, he went 11-0, yeah. Okay, so that Terry Bowden has been coaching re- since then? <laughs> he, I, did, I, honestly, I honestly had no idea. Not, so he left in 98, got out of coaching, left Auburn, got fired, got replaced by Tuberville. Took oh, some time I love off. I loved Tubbs with Miami Stop connections. It. By Tubbs has Miami connections, by the way. He does. He was out of coaching. They went back to North Alabama, okay, Division Two. was there for three years, has three good seasons, and then Akron hired him in 2012. He coached at Akron for seven seasons, <laughs> and you didn't realize that. No. He, he, he won the Idaho Potato Bowl in 2015, lost the Boca Raton Bowl in 17. So at least he go. got. At least he might have lost the bowl game, but better weather. But anyway, with him, I love that you know that he had three good seasons at North Alabama. Like anyone cares. Yeah, I mean, of course, <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, North Alabama is like a football institution, honestly. In Division Two, <laughs> go look them up. They have had some pretty pretty amazing runs. So that was the call for this game. A great crew in this one. Let's look at quickly the the coin toss. Did you see who flipped the coin? I, always, I, did, I, always I, ask I, I did, but I can't remember. And you think I'd write it down at this point, but I don't remember. You don't remember? Cal Ripken Jr. <laughs> How do you Big forget Cal. Cal? Cal. 
What in the world? Yeah, so Cal Ripken was out there. Like, it's always random seeing who's on these coin toss. Is because it's like who who is most relevant at the time. I'm trying to remember. Did he retire 2002? Is that he broke 01? the record? He broke the record in 01, didn't he? Yeah. So or, he retired right, after yeah. that. So yeah. So I guess he was just coming off, and he was the guy that flipped the toss. Always interesting to see. It was not Bill Cosby like the USC BCS championship game we talked about in the yeah. first episode. Yeah. But. Yeah. So yeah, so into the coaches. So coaching staffs, we mentioned Tressel and Coker, two guys in their second season. I thought more interestingly, though, were the assistant coaches and specifically for Ohio State, because I don't really remember the coaching staff as as much, but you look at it now and you can kind of get a sense of why they were so good. And honestly, it starts with Mark D'Antonio, who's a defensive coordinator in his second season there. Yeah, he's a solid. He's, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, anyone who watches college football knows he's a guy at Michigan State. When you think of him now, it's a, as the head coach for the Spartans, he gets the most out of his team. That's his mo. And I guess, I guess, looking back on it, you know, you look back on his track record now, we shouldn't be surprised at how much he got out of this defense here in this game. Uh, just a masterful job. Luke Fickle also was the special teams coach for this team. I had never. I didn't. I honestly, I didn't know he was there that long. I guess it. I guess it makes sense. And then Miami, he had to be one of the youngest assistants in college football at that time. I mean, he. I he remember because that's that's what threw me off because I was like, man, this guy was young when he wasn't he involved. Wasn't he the head coach before Meyer got there? Yeah, the he interim, was the interim. Or, yeah, yeah, the interim. 11, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then he he went on to uh, Cincinnati eventually. But yeah, that was a bit of a surprise for me. And then also Mel Tucker was on that staff. Mel Tucker, a guy that oh, okay. went to went to uh, NFL for a little bit, then was at Alabama, then Georgia. Now he's a head coach at Colorado. So he's bounced around a little bit. But he was kind of getting his, not start, but one of his early stops uh, in his coaching career was at Ohio State for this season. So they had a really good defensive staff. So it's pretty clear why they were so strong on that side of the ball. And then for Miami, their coaches, again, Larry Coker, you know, we'll talk about him a little bit more in this show later on. But you had Randy Shannon, your boy Randy, who would eventually become the head coach. And then Chud. Chud was the OC. Yeah, Chud. I like Chud. We, we, I mean, we, we've talked about Chud before. I like Chud. I thought he got a raw deal in, in the pros. I like Chud. I, I'll be completely honest. I have no idea where Chud is right now. But I, I bet you wherever he is, he's coaching his ass off. <laughs> Rod Chudzinski, he uh, he was his last appearance was as OC at the Colts, but that ended in 2017. So, according to the internet, he is not employed in college football or in the NFL right now. That's because he doesn't want to be. So he's not coaching his ass off anywhere. <laughs> he's not apparently. Unless he might be coaching like his kids' teams or something. Who knows? Getting yeah. after him there. He has three sons, so who knows? Uh, but yeah, so Chud was the OC and um, Shannon was the DC. So that staff, you know, look back on it. Again, not, you know, I know Chud was your boy, but you can kind of see why things were kind of start to turn the other direction from Miami at this point following Butch Davis uh, compared to what we saw, see on the other side with Ohio State. So uh, a little something of note on that angle. So how about players? Players in this game, I mean, look, it was all, all the headliners were on the Miami side of the field. And honestly, to me, it was more about the defense. There was really some good offensive players, but you look at that defense and being an Alabama guy, you know, I appreciate great defense. You talk about Vince Wilfork, you talk about Antrell Roll, you got Jonathan Jonathan Vilma, and then, of course, Sean Taylor. And that was not everybody, but that was kind of the, the guys that really stood out. And those guys, Vilma and Taylor especially, man, those guys were aggressive and violent on the football field. Yeah, those two were very good college players. Uh, as the professional level, I think maybe Taylor a little bit better than Vilma, but they were both great players. You had, like you said, you had Will Fork. Who, you know, even when Will Fork was a young college player, he's having seven, eight sacks a year. I think seven sacks this season from uh, from what I remember from the broadcast from a defensive tackle position. He ended up being a, a, a really good pro. Uh, you had DJ Williams, too, who, who had a long pro career, who was actually one of these. He's from De La Salle, you know, that powerhouse out in California. Yeah, he right. was the he was the number one recruit coming in. And I think he came in as a running back. I think he might have either played both sides of the ball when he first got to Miami or he started off as a running back and then eventually they had such a deep stable of running backs that he went over to linebacker. But th- this defense was just absolutely stacked. Believe it or not, not as stacked as the year before, but still very formidable. Yeah, and then the off- offensive side of the ball, you had Ken Dorsey, a uh, very very solid quarterback, but in terms of like superstar athletes and potential pros, you had McGahey, obviously, was uh, a star. Andre Johnson, Roscoe Parrish, and then the tight ends. The tight ends, during this period, Miami was was like tight end you. Kellen Winslow was the guy in this game, but then you also had uh, Shockey and Eric Winston. So you had 
Winston was on this team. Team uh, Eric Winston who later be- became a tackle in the NFL, so he was a, it looks a lot different in this game. Um, Shockey was the year before, so Shockey had already graduated at this point. Winslow w- was the stud on this team, and they had Bubba Franks before Shockey. I don't know if you remember right. Bubba Bubba Franks, and yeah, they had. I mean, Winston was basically a blocking tight end. Um, that's how good Winslow was back in the day, and then and he had a great game in this game, which we'll get to here in a little in a little while. And then offensively, they you know everyone was overshadowed by McGahey, and we'll get into what happened to McGahey a little bit later in this game. We already mentioned his injury, but the fallout from the injury and so on. And the guy who ended up maybe being the best professional player from this game was Andre Johnson. Uh, yeah, he was the stud. I mean, he's, he's the third still... pick overall in the draft that that would come up. Yeah, and he's still playing, right? No, he's retired. He is retired now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He he definitely. I thought he would have more of an impact in this game. He had a really good season, but you know, again, this isn't the air now where you have a lot. Of, you have a lot of teams where guys can have multiple players, 50, 60, 70 catches. This time, you know, you had a couple guys with around 50 and Johnson and, and Winslow. But you know, I think of Johnson. I, I think of a guy that should be catching 80 balls in a season for a college team, but. That's how loaded this this team was, though, from from top to bottom, and uh, they were fun to watch at this time, and this was no different. So, let's get into the game itself. Starting first quarter, this was a really good game, too, by the way. You know, pretty balanced. A lot of stuff happened really in every quarter. So, let's start the first quarter. Uh, it was defenses right out of the gates. Defenses were very strong on both sides. We saw Ohio State get to Miami early on, really limit what they were able to do early in this game, but Dorsey... On that first touchdown, really showed kind of the player he was. You know, he avoided pressure coming up the middle at him and hit Roscoe Paris for a 25-yard touchdown. And you kind of saw like, okay, this is the Miami team we, we expected to see. Dorsey comfortable in the pocket, not too rattled by this defense. And they got off to an early start. You know, it was a good sign for Miami at the time. Yeah, they got off to, I think, uh, initially in the first stages of this game, I think Miami was kind of taken aback by the amount of pressure that they were getting on Dorsey. They got a decent amount of pressure on him early. Remember, yeah. Dorsey, this offensive line, what we didn't mention when we went through the players was none of these offensive linemen for Miami really were big names in the pros, uh, but they were a solid unit, a veteran unit. They had only given up eight sacks all year, and you know Dorsey sacked twice early in this game. And really settled things down with that touchdown pass to Roscoe Parrish, who, again, if you've never seen highlights of him, uh, go back and watch some of his punt returns and his catches. One of these small, elusive guys. Yeah, he was indeed. Next possession, we get our first look at Sean Taylor. He makes a nice athletic interception on a deep pass, a tip, and and, and was able to uh, come down with it. So we saw kind of a look at him and the impact he was going to have in this game. And then by the time this, this quarter ended, I mean, it was all Miami. Ohio State had one first down in the first quarter, and Miami had that lead 7 nothing. Yeah, th- this is um, a slow start, certainly, for Ohio State. And he kind of had the feeling in that in that first quarter that maybe Krenzel was in a little bit over his head. Yeah, you kind of felt that way. I mean, and, and honestly, when you look back on it, that's just kind of the player he was. I mean, you probably watched him multiple times during that season in his career and said, this guy's in a little over his head, but you know they these coaches that went with this style of play, and Greg McElroy is another guy that I think of that is in a very similar uh, fashion, right? I mean, we don't need you to do a whole lot; just don't screw it up for us. Just make plays when you need to, uh, go, you know, get three or four yards on, on a scramble if you have to, and just don't throw the ball over. And, and Krenzel did that, but after that first quarter, you know, Miami was in a pretty good position, and Ohio State was still trying to figure it out. Good defensively, offense was having some trouble. Early second quarter, too, they flashed up a stat. Claret on his first seven carries, didn't have a single yard. He had zero yards rushing on his first seven carries. And I was kind of surprised looking back on this game. Claret really didn't have much of an impact. Me scored a couple times, but he didn't break off really any big plays. My main takeaway from – one of my main takeaways from the game and certainly of the first half was if Miami – you know, the second quarter, while the first quarter was encouraging for Miami, as we're going to get into now, the second quarter was not, okay? What I left this quarter thinking and the game at the end thinking was, if Miami made Ohio State's offense earn points and didn't give them points, I don't know that Ohio State was is even in this game at the end. That's it, fair. It, it, and, and I'm not just saying as a Miami fan, like being bitter about it. Um, it, it it's It's... One of those things where they executed what they do perfectly. I know this is a weird kind of strategy and style to have, but this is how this Ohio State team played. Even when the run wasn't working, they stuck to it. You know, they they yep. believed in their identity, and that and that you know it's it's cliche to say that about football teams, but it, it is very important. It is, and that second quarter though, overall, 
was sloppy from both sides, too. I mean, Ohio State faked a field goal uh, early in that second quarter, which, again, to me, if you're playing that style of play, why aren't you trying to take every point you can get when it's with out? An All-American, with an All-American kicker, too. Yeah, with it's, Mike Nugent. With a guy the Jets would draft in the second round, which is unbelievable. <laughs> but that's another. That's a, like They drafted him like 45th overall or something like that. Unbelievable when you think. I don't want to get frustrated <laughs> yeah. about I don't want to get frustrated about that right now. But he was an All-American kicker. And they would go into saying how the holder was one of the faster guys on the team. It's like, who cares? You know, I, 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 like you said, you, you don't know how many chances you're going to get against this good Miami defense. I thought that was a really bad call by Trestle. I did too. So got stopped. But then, look, Dorsey came back and, and threw, uh, turned the ball over. And Dorsey had a bad second quarter. Two turnovers and a fumble all in the second quarter for Dorsey. So the senior, the rock the rock for this offense and this team, who looked pretty good in the first quarter, the second quarter that, that defense and that pressure got to him, and he began to break. And I don't think he ever – he had some good plays throughout the game, but that quarter really kind of set the tone the rest of the way. Yeah, this quarter, I mean, three turnovers in a row on three possessions by Dorsey. Again, I thought there were some spotty spotty calls by Trestle where in the red zone he goes for he goes for the fake field goal, and then the next time he's in the red zone he goes with two quarterback sneaks in a row rather than running uh, Maurice Claret near the goal yeah. line, which I thought was, was, was fishy. But again, when you like I was mentioned before, when you go, you have three turnovers. It leads to fourteen of it leads to fourteen points directly. You yeah. know, and and kind of like stunned watching it, saying, "Wow, Miami's losing." You know, Ohio State's not even playing that great, and Miami's behind now. The only two touchdowns Miami, I mean Ohio State, would score in this game came in that quarter on turnovers, and the last one came after the Dorsey sack fumble. Claret punched it in gave Ohio State a 14-7 lead. They had all the momentum going to halftime. So as you mentioned, right, that was the story. Turnovers led to points and it gave Ohio State the lead. But third quarter started out and really good sequence early in this quarter. Krenzel completes a long pass down the left side. Ohio State looks like they're going in again. Then Sean Taylor steps in, makes his second pick of the game in the end zone, takes it out, and then Maurice Claret. His probably his biggest play of this game. He strips the ball from Sean Taylor on the return and gets the ball right back for Ohio State. And I had forgotten about this play, but I remember watching this play, and it was pretty amazing to watch this because Sean Taylor was such a good player and such an athlete. For him to go over there and take that ball from him was amazing then, and it still was pretty incredible now. That play was the, is maybe one of the single greatest football plays I've seen. To pair it with a play that should be near and dear to your heart, when I saw this play, Absolutely. I th- immediately thought of that George Teague play against Lamar Thomas in the 93 Sugar Bowl. It came to mind immediately when I was watching the game because this is something that you never see. You never see one player physically take the ball from another. And in two national championship games, you have this happen to two different, I mean, little different circumstances. One was stripped from a defensive player. One was stripped from a wide receiver. But you had th- this, this play happened twice to Miami in national championship games and a play that I don't think I've ever seen since. Have you? Yeah, it doesn't happen. I mean, I can't off the top of my head think of anything. Not when a guy's sprinting, you know? Not when a guy's in a dead sprint and someone takes it from him. That was a huge play. And 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 I credit ABC, too. They had the the footage from that Sugar Bowl queued up, ready to go. And Fouts even pointed out, number 13, both times, Teague and uh, and also Claret, where the guys stripped it from Miami. Fouts Fouts was on at this game. I got yeah, on him was. a little bit in the USC game, the USC Texas game, but Fouts was really on it this game. He, I thought he did a really, really good job. Keith Jackson was obviously his normal, um, amazing self. But look, you now you have this this little mishap lead to a field goal, and now all seventeen points for Ohio State are off turnovers. Yep, yep, indeed. And then this quarter ended with McGahey. I thought the other notable thought on this quarter was we kind of saw McGahey and both running backs had really had no impact in the first half. But we started seeing McGahey come to life in this quarter. We started seeing Miami give him the ball a little bit more, and he started looking like he was starting to take over a little bit in this game, heading into that fourth quarter. And the timing couldn't be any worse because they needed that offensive spark that he was providing because they were down 17-7 at that point, or 17-14 at that point in the third quarter. And he was kind of bringing them back to life. But we saw it. 11 minutes left in the quarter. Mike pointed it out earlier. McGahey gets hit on the knee, square on the knee, we see the leg buckle backwards, and you can't see it in real time from the angle that we had. The, the, the hit was kind of blocked off by another player, and you couldn't see it. 
and I couldn't watch the replay. I, I knew it was coming, and I knew what had happened. And when they went back to the replay before either announcer knew what had just happened on the field, I had to turn away, but I just listened to the reaction to Fouts, and you could just hear it immediately. Oh, my God, that is a serious injury, and you knew it right away. Yeah, I mean, in the second half, McGay, he has six yards per carry. Like you said, they're getting him more involved. I know a lot. I know everyone probably listens to this, even if you're younger. You know who Willis McGay he is. But if you if you didn't see him play in college, you never really saw the breakaway speed that he had. He still had the same power like he did when he was in the NFL, but he had that breakaway speed, and that never really got back fully, in my opinion, from this injury. And I can't imagine the thoughts racing through his mind. When you think about number one, I'm, this is a national championship game. Number two, you know I'm I'm going to be a top pick in the draft, and this happens. You know uh, it had to be crazy for him. I can't remember a, an injury to a more significant player in a Nash, in a big game like this, probably other than Colt McCoy against Alabama. I can't think right. I mean, is that really the yeah. one? The other one that comes to mind? I, I, this was this, and at this point in the game. I know the Colt McCoy injury happened early in the game. Th- this injury happened right as Miami was gaining momentum, and it, it, it was it was it was really deflating as a fan. And, and I'm sure even if you weren't a Miami fan, it was probably deflating watching it. Yep, and it, and it really it what could have been a probably a really fun quarter with him back there and, and kind of sparking that offense and maybe kind of picking up the pace a little bit. Because I would have loved to have seen Miami take a lead and force Ohio State to open it up a little bit more. They never had to, though. Uh, this quarter, again, still a little bit sloppier like the second quarter. Not what you'd expect to see in the end of a national championship game between two uh, really good teams and two undefeated teams. But we saw two more missed field goals this quarter. Roscoe Parrish, your boy, fumbled on uh, what was a great pass by Dorsey that had them knocking on the door again inside the, the 30 or the 20-yard line. Circle that one. Circle that, was that a one. huge one. That was huge. It's fifth turnover of the game now, if you're counting at home. Because you had the three by Dorsey. You had the one by Taylor when he got stripped by Colorado, which is technically a turnover, and which is a turnover. And now you have the one by Parrish, which was huge. And then you you mentioned the missed field goal by Mike Nugent. So just to recap, the guy, the Jets draft a guy who the only probably big kick he's ever had in his life, you know, he misses. But the Jets drafted him 45th overall. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely love it. And speaking of kickers, so Miami tied the game up. They got the ball all the way down, and they got themselves they got set up for a field goal as time expired. And Todd Seavers was the guy that kicked this field goal, and I do not for the life of me ever remember the name Todd Seavers. Look, I was a fan, and I forgot his name. So, Dude, I, so yeah, so I, I don't, I don't blame you there. A, I thought this guy was a CPA somewhere. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, it was a clutch kick. You know, it was a clutch kick. I mean, he missed the kick. He hit a big one later on in the, you know, later on in the quarter. But um, yeah, I mean, sure. it, it's, you know, and, and something other of note in the fourth quarter here is they showed a graphic of Krenzel at one point in the fourth quarter was five for 15 passing. Yeah. And most of his pass yards came in that long pass to gamble that you, that you talked about before, right before the uh, Sean Taylor play. Yeah. So yeah, this right. is and and Krenzel was running the ball effectively, running the ball prob- a lot more than I remember him ever doing in this game and in his career as a whole. But again, Ohio, it's not like I keep on going back to these turnovers, but it's not like Ohio State's offense was prolific in any way in this game. No, they weren't. I'm glad you mentioned uh, Gamble because we didn't touch on him earlier on, but he was really a good player, and I don't remember him as much. I mean, I remember who he was and. You know, that name's one that sticks with me, but I'd kind of forgotten how good of a player he was. I kind of would like to see him on a different team, maybe with a better offense, but him playing both ways, I mean, he he made a, he didn't make any huge, huge monumental plays in this game, but he seemed to be in on every kind of key moment. It seemed like he was a guy that was there for Ohio State. Yeah, the, what was impressive, the, you know, certain graphics when they put them up uh, on these games that really stick in your mind, and I don't even need to write it in my notes. And in this game, it was the um, when they showed the graphics of the amount of plays that Chris Gamble had played not in previous games and also in this game. I mean, I yeah. think he played like a hundred, they said it in the overtime, I think, like 118 plays in the game. That's wild. That is incredible. Yeah, he 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 was a fun player to watch, but I just want to I wanted to hit him real quick because uh, I we didn't do it yet, and he he deserves uh, some recognition because he was a pretty awesome player in this game and uh, for his career. So we got overtime, and you know we get to this point, you got to kind of feel like this is still Miami's game to to lose because as you mentioned, five turnovers. You know Ohio State had about two hundred and twenty yards of offense at this point, I think, for the game. 
hadn't really done a whole lot uh, outside of a couple plays. So we get to overtime, and Miami, there was a couple big moments for Miami. And really it was, first off, and I'd totally forgotten about this play until we went back, but Ohio State had a 4th and 14 on their possession. After after a 3rd and 14 where they they called a screen play. Yep. Uh, unreal. I, 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 Ohio, I mean, I can't stress, stress enough how, how unimpressed I was after re-watching this with Ohio State's offense, but duly noted how impressed I was with their defense. And uh, that 4th and 14, I mean, if you're Miami, who do you think the ball is going to here? <laughs> I, 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 I think Jenkins was wide open. It made it made no sense. And Miami had scored, as we failed to mention, they scored the first possessions. They were up seven, so Ohio State had to go for it. But that fourth and 14, 14 yards for this Ohio State offense felt like an eternity. And I don't feel like on the broadcast it was it felt like a huge moment. I don't feel like it was set up by Jackson and Fouts as like the game comes down to one play. I didn't feel like it was that kind of a moment. And then, of course, Ohio State converts. But then the Ohio State continues this drive, and they get down again inside the, the 10, and they're they're going in again, and they're still struggling to get this ball into the end zone. They had another fourth down in this overtime. They got a pass interference call on a fourth and, fourth and three. Okay, They gave them another first down. So now they had, again, to get finally get in the end zone after two fourth down plays and 11 total plays in their overtime possession from the 25. They ran 11 total plays before they got in the end zone. And they would get into, you know, they would get into the end zone on, a, on another Craig Krenzel uh, sneak, which uh, talk about a play that, that that offense loves when you have Claret in the backfield. But it's it's always puzzling to me when when when, uh, when teams do that. But um yeah, the Krenzel sneak TD, like you said, made it 24-24. And obviously that fourth and three that you just mentioned was the big call that everyone talks about. Yep, it was that fourth and three, and that was the call that uh, that I still can't quite get over. To me, it was it just felt, because of the moment, and I don't think we ever got a true look at the flag where it came in. I don't think I saw it on this broadcast. I remember seeing it at some point, but that call was so delayed and there's been a lot of back and forth on this since the game that, okay, you know, maybe they were right. Some people say agree with the referee, some don't, or the officials. But either way, the defense of effort wasn't bad. It wasn't a, a blatant interference call. It was a call that could go either way on any given day. And the fact that it came in so late was what you never see, ever. And, like, the entire team... Sean Taylor had thrown his helmet off, and they referenced this. He had thrown his helmet off, and it broken into pieces. He had to miss the first play after that because his helmet was <laughs> in so many pieces. But Larry Coker was on the field taking off his headset. You know, everybody was storming the field before anybody realized the flag had been thrown. Yeah, that was the issue with the play. So you had, I believe it was the, because they showed a replay of it at a certain angle, and you had the referee at the pylon signaling incomplete pass. So it wasn't him who threw the flag. It must have been, I don't know if they call him the back judge, the guy in the back line there. He's the one who threw the flag, and he had the worst view in the whole stadium of of the play. You know, he's right on top of it in the back, and, and you know, in the back of it, when you had the, the ref right at the pylon, right where the play was being was being made, and right where all the contact was being made, who signaled incomplete pass. And like you said, it was such a delayed call. Everyone had started celebrating. The Miami players even looking back to see if there was a penalty, didn't see anything. They start celebrating. And this is my gripe with this call, and it always has been. Gamble had a chance to catch the ball. If you look at the play, right. and Fouts right. was all over this, Sharp didn't make contact with him until the ball made contact with Gamble. It's clear as day. And Fouts made another good point. They didn't call holding. They called pass interference. Yep, even though like he signaled holding when he was well, coming in from the end zone uh, to the head official. But he said afterwards that he replayed it in his mind and wanted to make sh- he wanted to make double sure it was the right call. But if you're thinking that long about the call, don't flow the flag. In that moment, it was tough to watch for Miami, no matter who you're pulling for. And it felt like after all everything that Ohio State had been kind of given for Miami in this ball game, here it was one last time when Miami had risen up defensively and what seemingly seemed like they had not stopped them and, and was heading to another national championship, and this thing was ripped out of their hands. So that's the call. I mean, that's still one of the big calls by a referee in any kind of championship game that you can remember. I mean, you think back on them, the tuck rules, obviously one of the big ones, but this one is right there with it in terms of what it meant because 
this was the game. I mean, it wasn't like this was on the way in and then four plays later there was a touchdown. This was the end of the game. National championship, confetti about to come down, and then no, it didn't happen. So I don't know. Do you, you, you look back on this at all and think it was – a? could you justify the call at all or do you still think it's complete garbage? I think it was. it's just as – just as a guard, it's uh, I, I'm speechless. It was it was a really bad call. And look, look, no one wants these referees to decide this game because I, I think they've I think referees in multiple sports have proven over the years that they buckle under pressure just like athletes do. You know, they're not they're not infallible, right? I mean, I, if no one wants to, a ref to be in a situation where they can, they can control who wins and who loses, but in this case, it, it had a direct correlation. They needed to stop them on that one play. The ref made a bad call and. Miami ended up paying the ultimate price for it. Ohio State got the ball in the second overtime. They went down. Claret scored, gave Ohio State the 31-24 lead, and then Miami came back down, and eventually Dorsey gets uh, pressured. He got leveled. Down. He got leveled earlier in that drive. <laughs> I, I think that's what – I think they had to yeah. bring in our backup quarterback for a play. Good point. And, and looking back on it, where, where this – the one chance Miami had on that last drive was on, a second, on the yep. second down, Winston was wide open. Eric Winston was wide open in the flat, and he completely missed him. And again, I, I keep on saying this, but the announcers were right on it. That's a pass that Dorsey never missed, and he right. completely missed him. I think it. I think it had to do with the fact that he he got drilled. I think it was Doss, right, who came yeah. on a blitz and drilled him, yeah. and uh, he he was hurt. But you know, hey, look, like I said, like I've been saying, that Ohio State defense they they rose to the challenge at every turn. That last blitz call on the fourth down was a great call, also. It was. Their defense really won that game for Ohio State. It was an impressive defensive effort, and uh, no surprise that uh, that was the story for the Buckeyes under Jim Trestle. So final thoughts on the game, just kind of big picture stuff. Um, you know, we talk about the talent on the field, but the, the number of NFL players on this in this game, and, and really you could say this about a lot of Miami teams at the time, whoever they were playing, but in this game alone, 43 players who started in the game, 37 of them were eventual NFL draft picks including 18 first-rounders. And of the 100 players that played in the game, 58 went on to play in the NFL. Wow. 58% of, of the of the field, basically, yeah. went on to play in the NFL. And a lot of these guys, I mean, they, they had long careers. Antro Roll had a long career. Jonathan Vilma, Vince Wilfork. I'm trying to think of some of the Ohio State guys. I mean, uh, Andre Johnson had a long uh, Andre career. Andre Johnson had a really long career. Yeah, there's guys I'm missing here. But, um, yeah, a lot of these guys, very long careers and ended up being good pros. And, yeah. So let's move into a little bit of post-game conversation now and kind of how this game impacted each team moving forward. So for Miami, I mean, this was kind of the start of the fallout, right? I mean, the Miami was untouchable at this point in the early 2000s, but this is the first time they showed any kind of weakness. And then with Dorsey kind of moving out of there, that was kind of the beginning of the end for them. I think Dorsey was that last piece because they had a lot of other talented players, but it seems like that quarterback position was a spot where they had trouble filling in the gaps at times. And with him gone, it made a loss. But that was really kind of the last uh, hurrah for this Miami team for quite a while, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and you had you had people who were uh, Dorsey doubters uh, when he was there that, you know, hey, he just won because he had the talent around him. Well, hey, look, no no quarterback at Miami's won like that since. So, um, you know, he, he was a very good college quarterback. They were never able to adequately replace him, and they were never able to, you know, they were never able to rekindle what they did in this three-year period. And I attribute that a lot to Butch Davis leaving. Yeah, absolutely. Butch Davis was kind of the guy for this for this team, and it built this team up to where it was and put them in this position to have this run from 2000 to 2003 that they did. And then, you know, Miami ended up leaving the Big East. They were the Big East at the time, uh, which is cr- still crazy to think about for anybody that kind of follows the sport now. The Big East was s- such a great conference at the time, but they moved to the ACC in 2004, and since that time have not won a conference championship. Pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah, I mentioned that I mentioned this on a previous podcast. I, I think it was on the uh, Nebraska, the Nebraska, Florida uh, podcast that we did. But when when th- when this realignment happened, where Miami and Florida State went to the ACC, I believe it was a big thing for them to be put in different divisions, right? Because at that point they were so dominant, the thinking was, okay, hey, look, more years than not, we'll get a Miami, Florida State, you know, regular season game, which they always play anyway. And we'll get a, a, a conference championship game. Also, I believe they did that. I, I'll yep. go back and look. Um, but did. it's it's never it's never for it's never come to fruition. They've never been good at the same time, probably since this season. Yeah, 
Because this was the yeah. was this the end of the way? This was after right after Wanky, right? This was right. the Chris Ricks era, I believe. Yeah. So I mean, that's it's, it's been kind of crazy what's happened to Miami since that time. And then for Ohio State, I mean, the Buckeyes have kind of been a steady team, steady program throughout some some NCAA stuff, a couple coaching changes, but you know, it wasn't much longer where Trestle gets pushed out and then Meyer comes in. So for Ohio State, this was just kind of you know the next step. It didn't really propel them. To anything else necessarily just kind of a, another chapter of their story history yeah this was a solid team and, and they're always good I mean I, I I don't know if it's the lack of quality competition you know in the mid and lower levels of the of the Big Ten but Ohio State's always a team I mean even if they're having a subpar year you could pencil them in for nine ten wins a year and yeah I mean, and Trestle Trestle took when I think of Trestle I think of a coach that took them to the next level. Like they'd always been really good, but he took them to this level, to this national championship. He took the Big Ten Conference to a different level. Because like you said, this was the first Big Ten team to be in a BCS championship game. And when I think of Trestle, that's what I think of. And then he got into the trouble with the NCAA, and then Meyer comes in and builds even more of a juggernaut. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, Cooper Cooper had that program near the top of the Big Ten, year in, year out, you know, going against Lloyd Carr and that rivalry. But yeah, Trestle was the kind of the guy that took him to that next level and won the championships and, and kept them. I mean, really, he had a run where he won five straight Big Ten titles, six straight, I think, actually, before they had to relinquish one because of the NCAA sanctions. But you know, he was a guy that was perfect fit for that team and that program. And look, he got caught up in the the sanctions, and he lied. And it was as simple as that. They, you know, so we gonna go into this next uh, segment where we talk about how everybody kind of played out. Let's start with Trestle. I mean, he was a guy that looked like he could have been there forever. Coached at Youngstown, was an Ohio guy, was perfect for this team. And then all the the tattoo gate came out, and he acted like he didn't know that it happened. And then there was uh, emails that came out that showed that he had conversations about this information and didn't pass it along to anybody, and they had no choice but to fire him at that point. And kind of hated for Trestle because, look, this is stuff that probably a lot of coaches are getting into, but we learned one thing from the NCAA. You just got to deny, deny, deny until the bitter end, and he tried, but it caught up with him. Yeah, and it's compared to some other uh, infractions that the, uh, some other coaches have had here in recent memory. I mean, Art Bryles comes to mind. Uh, I think what Trestle did pales in comparison to what a guy like Art Bryles did and some other some of the other scandals that we've seen. But like you said, it got to a point where, you know, the NCAA had to do something with Trestle, and it's really affected his whole career. Um, yeah. I, I, he's another guy. I honestly don't know what – I know at one time he was an advisor for the Indianapolis Colts in the NFL – Yep. But I don't know what he's been doing, what he's been doing since. But he was a he was a, st- a star. He was one of these guys where he was one of these star college coaches, uh, uh, you know, at, at a big university. He, he he was he was a quality coach. He had a, he had an identity, and when you thought of him, you thought of that dopey sweater vest he used to wear, and <laughs> and and his his sort of team sort of matched that, right? Conservative yeah. sweater vest. Don't screw up and be disciplined. You know that that was Jim Trestle's team. Yeah, he, he, he was one year at the Colts, and then now he is the president at Youngstown State. So he's come back in, and now he's in the administration there. But, yeah, I mean, I think when we have this new era of, of college sports where players can profit off their likeness, this whole scandal is going to seem like such a joke when it's all said and done. So I agree with you on that point. To be honest, um, it was a, it, to be honest for anyone who – it was a joke back then, too. <laughs> Yeah, it was. You know, it, it was just a joke. Like, I, I, it's somewhere. Yeah, it's a violation. But come on, are we really going to go scorched earth over this and ruin a whole program? I mean, yeah. compare. Look, compared he what he did to compare what to what Myers accused of doing. Right. Is it really apples and apples comparison? And I and I don't and and you know what uh, happened over Penn State. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's yeah. what I was. And Arp Riles, you know. And it, when you look back on it, even in the moment, it was kind of like, really, Jim Trestle's going to lose his job over this. And I think it was, like you said, I think it was the circumstances surrounding it more than m- maybe what the actual infractions were. Well, it's tough when you lie and uh, it comes back to catch you. And it's hard to uh, defend that at that point. But the other kind of big what happened after this, you know, was Sean Taylor, I think, is another one of the guys we kind of point out from this game. You know, we were both at ESPN the, the morning that the news broke on Sean Taylor, which was pretty crazy. We still have our own memories and stories of, of how that went down. But, you know, it sucks for, for for football fans because he was kind of that guy that was in a, in a sport where there's so many physical talents and it's hard to stand out. He was one of those guys that could separate himself from the 1%. He was the 1% of the 1%. 
Yeah, he was just uniquely talented. So he was like, a, he was a, a big safety who was fast, who could cover, and who could hit. You know, a lot of times now in the NFL, you have a lot of guys who are good at certain things. Maybe you have a safety who can come up in the box and hit, but not cover. A, a guy who can cover, but he doesn't want to tackle anyone. Sean Taylor was, I think it was like 6'3", 230, wasn't he? And yeah, he, he, was he, was, he was just all over the field. He was a great player. And uh, like you said, that, that day that day that he that he you know, that he died was a day that I'll never forget. And it was, it was a shame. It it was really, really a shame. It was. Um, And in case you're wondering about Larry Coker too, you know, his career in Miami did not last long. 2006, he was out the door. Do you know where he went next? I don't. I'm coming off real bad this podcast with remembering where these guys <laughs> well, we went. Well, know you're not. You're I don't. College. I don't. I didn't. I didn't know once. It was all down. Once I didn't know where that Terry Bowden was at North, North Alabama. <laughs> I knew this was going to be a, t- a tough day here. Well, I don't expect you to keep up with uh, UT San Antonio, but that's where he ended up and coached for uh, seven seasons uh, at UTSA. So just so you know, he wasn't completely out of coaching, but he did spend a little bit of time there, and they were okay. They had a couple of decent seasons, but uh, otherwise, it was really taken over from. From Coker, and it shows you kind of how important it is to find that next guy after a really good after a really good head coach. And Davis isn't even a guy that you consider an all time great, right? I mean, he had a really good moment, and you know he probably works in the gray area quite a bit. But finding a guy that can just maintain that success is so difficult, and how quickly a dynasty can fall down and collapse is evident by Coker. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to take shots at Coker, but he wasn't the guy for that position. And it showed quickly. And I don't think it even showed during the interviews in this game that he wasn't the guy for that job. He seemed kind of a little timid, a little nervous, and compared to what Trestle sounded like in the interviews, and this thing quickly fell apart for Miami. Yeah, you knew in the moment. You uh, Coker's one of those guys. You knew in the moment he wasn't going to be the long-term coach for Miami. You just you knew it then. You just knew, okay, he's got right. this two-year window where he's going to have, you know, you'd have to be a complete moron to screw it up. Just don't screw it up was really the, the the game plan for him as far as coaching goes because um, they had a lot of leaders on this team in terms of the players and and the uh, and the veterans they had and you know he I think he ended up being the coach you thought he was going to be to be honest I, I don't think I wasn't surprised a bit how his uh, tenure at Miami went. No, nope. well, let's move now into what if what if scenarios from this game what could have changed the outcome and the way things played out and I've got a couple so. Let me uh, throw a couple your way, Mike, on this one. Obviously, the pass interference call is is the one that uh, seems most obvious. But I got a couple for you. What if Gamble's catch uh, on the sideline would have been reviewed late in this game? It was just over two minutes left. He he goes out of bounds, and it looked like he was pretty close to making this catch. This was Ohio State's last possession in regulation. It would have been a first down, would have been right around two minutes. They could have run out the clock. Instead, wasn't reviewed. There was no review. It was ruled incomplete. Ohio State punts, and then Roscoe Parrish returns it 44 yards to start that drive that they led to that game-tying field goal. That was going to be my what-if, but I have I have another one involving Roscoe Parrish. Okay. But, but that Roscoe Parrish, when, when he returned that punt, okay, that's one of the few things I remember about this game watching it live because I remember thinking, wow, all this stuff that went wrong. We got this huge punt return by Parrish. Man, if Miami scores and we get out of here with a win and they get away with this with how bad they played, how awesome would that be? You know, so right. I that was a that's a really good one you pointed out there. And then I ha- the other one I had, the other the one of the what ifs I had was that Roscoe Parrish fumble that we talked about before. Right. Um, that was a huge, 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 huge play in this game. Um, I thought it swung a lot of the momentum. And you know, what if he, what if he doesn't, you know, what if he doesn't fumble? Um, you yeah. know, how is this? How does this game turn out differently? Roscoe Parrish was involved in a, in a lot of big plays in this game. Actually, looking back on it, and uh, both of our what ifs sort of sort of cover that. And I think the biggest what if in this game, and maybe going forward after this game, is the McGahey injury. Does that Im- did that impact Miami at all? You know, I don't know if it impacted. I don't think that. I think the players still played hard and played well. The players that were remaining, but there's no telling how his impact would have been felt on the game itself. Yeah, and I and and that kind of is, is ties into mine a little bit, but mine more so. What happens if you remember this? And this is kind of a, a really out there what if, and it's nothing you can really control. But just a few plays before the injury on that Miami drive, uh, it was a third and long that Miami converted, and right on the marker too, like right on the spot, but. McGahee's the guy that picked up the key block on that on a blitzer to keep that drive alive or else they would have punted and 
things would have changed. But it's one of those, you know, that guy doesn't do his job. What could have happened? It's pretty crazy uh, when you look back on it like that. But just a couple of the moments from this game that maybe could have swung things the other way. Social media. Let's go social. What would have been different about this game had social media existed when it occurred? Yeah, two two things. I mean, are the most obvious about this, and it's first the pass interference call. There would have been a lot of different opinions on how that one went down. A lot of of shade being thrown towards Miami fans, and then the injury. The injury would have been the most probably. They would have been trending one and two. I guess Porter, the the official, would have been number one, and then McGay he probably would have been number two. I think in this game. Yeah, for sure. I mean, those two moments. As far as overarching moments from this game that would have killed on social media, those two far and away. They would have had every angle of this review, and it would have been blown up way out of proportion. Reviews of the McGehee injury, with his knee blown up, and then of, of the play in the end zone. I also think on social media, the Jimmy Kimmel stuff would have would have killed would have, would have been all over social media also. Uh, everything he was involved in up until that point. Looking back on it, he's probably lucky there was no social media back then. Because I don't know, I don't know if it, with his track record of what would have been on YouTube and everywhere else, I don't know if he would have landed the uh, the gig that he had. Yeah, and I'm actually kind of surprised that that maybe that Bachelorette didn't come along a little ahead of its time because obviously with social media, it's really what helped that thing kind of take off. But I, I, I'm like you, I didn't really pay attention to it, didn't really know it was around that early, and mainly because of the because of social media. That's the only place I see that show now is is talked about on social media. So yeah, and a lot of, and of, a lot of like, there's a lot of podcasts that's, that that are based on a lot of like radio oh, yeah. shows. will do segments on it. It's it's a huge show. I mean, I know we don't watch it, but but uh, there's people that watch it. Obviously, it's been on for 17 years. Um, Limp Biscuit also playing in the pregame. Do you notice that? <laughs> I did not. Little Limp Biscuit leading us in and out of break in the pregame. Love me some Limp Biscuit. Yeah, who yeah, did? Those guys who, were, those guys who were did, great. The time. Yeah, you're lying. You it, wore those with your painter's pants, probably. Yeah, the red Yankee hat. Right. That's what I always make fun of Yankee fans that that they're too busy not paying attention to the game because they're trying to pick out where they're going to get their next uh, colored Yankee hat from. <laughs> I love it. Uh, what if I would have told you, Mike? Let's move into this real quickly and finish out the show. All right, Mike. What if I would have told you, following this loss to Ohio State, that Miami, this team that had been just crushing opponents in the '80s, '90s, and into the 2000s, would have just two 10-win seasons over the next 17 years. That was 2003, they won 11 games the following year after this game. And then once again in 2017, they won 10 games. Those are the only two seasons this program has won 10 games since this loss. You, you, I, would have, I would have told well, you. Well, your mind didn't. I would have told you no way. Again, I'm speechless. And, you know, <laughs> and what if I told you that I believe, now I may stick my foot in my mouth here, but what if I told you that this game would be Maurice Claret's last game as a collegiate player. Yeah, what if, another what, crazy one. That's a what, true freshman. What, what, what if I, as a true freshman, for those of you not familiar, and Ben, let me know if I have the story a little bit wrong here, but M- Maurice Claret would try to challenge and be led into the uh, to uh, declare for the for the draft this upcoming year after being a true freshman, and he got denied, right? And he had to sit out. Correct. But but he had already declared as a professional and didn't go back to college. Is that how it went? Yeah, yeah, he had some run-ins with Ohio State while he was there, and then yeah, he after he got dismissed, he decided he would try to sue the NFL and uh, in, in for not being able to draft him, and he eventually got drafted in 2005, a year later, and uh, he had a lot of problems off the field too, depression, alcoholism, and he's actually had a really great turnaround. He's another guy we probably should have mentioned on kind of where are they now, but he's kind of got he's got a great brand actually. He's built a good business. He's got a podcast. He's got a couple of things going on, and and really he's kind of a motivational speaker about hey, this is where where I was, where I came from. But you're talking about a guy that who was a superstar. I mean, Big Ten Freshman of the Year, Mr. Mr. Football in high school, you know, really one of the top recruits coming out. And this is a guy that basically didn't play at all after this game. Yeah, you never heard from, from a, on the football. You heard a lot from him off the football field, like you mentioned, with the suing of the NFL, with the trying to enter the draft early. Look, coming into this game, the two headliners were McGahee and Claret. This was, make no mistake about it, this was still a point in time in football where good running backs were, were very, very popular and often in college would overshadow quarterbacks. Um, right. You've had a run lately here for a while where quarterbacks have won the Heisman. But you know, th- those were the two stars. Claret was the true freshman, and he was... He was the headliner for Ohio State, even with that great defense that ended up stealing the show in this particular game. 
But uh, Maurice Claret is a, is a big what if I told you, man. I, I would that's, never that's believe. A great one. You never see him play. You know, ne- you never really see him play football again that I can remember. Yeah. And I think there's a thirty for thirty that he's included in, or some kind yeah, of. It's, it's him and Tressel. It's yeah. the same one. Like it's called Youngstown Boys or something. Yeah, something exactly. to that effect because they're both from there. Yep. Yeah, that's a great one. And his career is one that. Um, I mean, at the time, this guy was an all all world type of player. I mean, he had so much hype, and and really, I don't even know if you ask guys now if they even remember who he is. Like guys that are in college now, uh, high school and college age kids, if they'd even have any idea who he was. They but. probably, you know, who they would know his buddy. I think Ted Ginn, right? Didn't he go to the same high school with Ted Ginn, where Ted Ginn's father was the coach? I believe so. I, I believe they did. And and Ted Ginn might have been Ted Ginn was right after that. Was right after this time period in college, I believe. Because he was on the team when they lost to when they lost to Florida in the national championship game, I believe. Right. Because he exactly. ran he ran the opening kickoff back and they didn't do anything the rest of the game. And you mentioned he got hurt in that game too, didn't he? Talk about guys that got hurt in a yeah yeah game. yeah yeah. He's still playing. Uh-huh. He's still playing Ted again. Yeah, it's crazy. How, some of these guys, the longevity they have. Um, my last what if, and again a Miami one. I'm going to keep prodding you and poking you with some stats that'll make you cringe, but. What if I told you too, Mike, those 17 years that I mentioned, they, you've only had two 10-win seasons. Miami's only been ranked at the final in the final AP poll just six times over those 17 seasons. Just ranked. That's all I'm talking about is being ranked here. Only six times in 17 seasons. Only once inside the top 10. Six times in, se- so si- in, six times in 17 seasons, they haven't even been in the top 25 teams in the country. No, 11 of 17, they haven't been. Oh, the 11 of 17, they haven't. That's... Obviously, yeah, I, I, obviously, I believe it because I'm living it. So it, you know, it, yeah. honestly, honestly, you know, like because Miami's been so down lately, it's turned me into a lot more of a sort of a universal college football fan. You know, I just watch yeah, yeah. more games. I watch more SEC games. I watch more. Um, hey, what draft prospect is playing tonight? You know, I watch more. I, I do more of my watching like that now because Miami's been so down. I think a lot of Miami fans are probably in that same boat. A lot of the the fans that adopted this program. In the 80s and 90s have probably turned away as well. Uh, let's wrap it up, Mike. Just some final thoughts in this game. How much did you enjoy watching this one? Anything that kind of surprised you going back on it? You know what? Nothing surprised me. And and and, and looking back on this game and really dissecting it, you know, while I was watching it, I, c- I couldn't really be that surprised with the outcome based on what Miami's track record had been all season. And in the moment, you didn't realize it, but Miami was only plus two in turnover margin for the entire season up to this point. They had the third most penalties in the NCAA. And what hurt them in this game? Penalties, yep. turnovers, and they happened to be up against an opponent that wasn't, you know, a Big East opponent, right? I mean, it was a quality opponent. So yep. my takeaway, my, my main takeaway from this is, look, they lost, but a lot of the things that played them in this game were problems all season, but everyone else they played in the whole season, they were just overwhelmed, overwhelmingly more talented then. Yeah, I, I'm going to quickly throw you one more what if. What if Davis was still the coach? They win that championship. I can't say they would have won this one game. They would have been better coached. They would have been more right. prepared. I, let's exactly. put it to, I, I think I get what you're saying. The, the, the penalties wouldn't have been as big of an issue. Exactly. Across the, the whole turnovers. It would have been a more disciplined team. I agree. For me, yeah, I, I enjoyed watching this game again. I think the big thing was I'd forgotten about that Claret play, the strip of Taylor. That was a pretty incredible moment. Uh, and then, you know, two of the big, big memories from this, and almost everybody still. Uh, when you think of BCS, you think of some big, big moments, and you had the pass interference and the Will Smith injury both happened in this game. So it was a pretty monumental game, and one that that's why we went back and watched it. But going back a second time, a nice win for Ohio State, but probably one of the least impressive championship teams of the BCS era. Even though they were fourteen and zero, they just weren't flashy. But if you ask an Ohio State fan, they probably don't care. So there you have it. That's going to do it for this episode of Distant Replay. We appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts. You can do so and have this next episode delivered right to your inbox. And while you're there, leave us a review or a rating. We'd, we'd appreciate both. Email us if you have any thoughts on the show, any games you think we should see. You can email us at distantpodcast at gmail.com or you can hit us on Twitter at Distant Podcast there as well. And our website will have this game. You can watch the feed just as we watched it, this game all over again on ABC. You can watch it on our website, distantreplaypodcast.com. Mike, enjoy the time again man enjoy talking about this game I had a lot of fun me as well ben and uh we'll catch you guys next time be sure like ben said check out the previous episodes drop us a line on some games that you want to hear us cover and uh thanks again for joining us that'll do it for us for mike noto i am ben george we appreciate you being a part of the distant replay podcast